The Leafs look to get back into the win column as they face a desperate Panthers team in Sunrise tonight. Sheldon Keefe raging in his lines once again, but I think it's a little different this time, Dave. I'll explain in just a few moments. Let's get into it. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked On Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. What's going on, Leafs Nation? It's Mike DiStefano and David Morissuti here, your host at Locked On Leafs. Uh, we got daily content coming out to you both via audio and video form. Go check us out. Subscribe also um, to our podcast on YouTube. Our, our, we're, 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 our goal is to get to 3K by playoffs. we got less than a month to get to 3K. We're, we got, what, 27, 30, so we need about 250, 260-ish more followers to get to our goal. So help us get there. Share the pod uh, with the rest of your pals. That's part of Leafs Nation. Bunch of stuff to get to today, Dave. Um, we got some practice updates that we got to get to. The lines have been uh, rejiggled again. And uh, so we'll talk about that both up front and on the blue line. Um, we got a game tonight, Leafs and Panthers. And, I mean, this is going to be, I think, a testy one. You've got Toronto, who wants to try and uh, avenge the loss that they just suffered in that poor performance against the Islanders. you got the Panthers, who are fighting for a playoff spot. Like, this game will be meaningful, hopefully, for both sides. Yeah, and this is especially a Panthers team that's playing very well of late. Like, they're... They, we, I didn't think that they were going to be in a playoff position just the way that their season was going. And they, of course, proved me wrong after doing absolutely nothing at the trade deadline. So, yeah, the Leafs are uh, not a great team to, f- to face after you had a pretty brutal loss, but maybe a team that might get them to kind of push a little bit harder, try a little bit harder. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, the Panthers are 7-2-1 and one in their last 10 games. So, yeah, they've definitely clawed their way back into the playoff race up until a couple of moments before we hopped on to record. They were in a playoff spot, now out of a playoff spot, with the Pittsburgh Penguins laying a bit of a beatdown on the Colorado Avalanche, 5-2. to two. So they hop back up in that final wildcard spot. We'll get into the uh, the Eastern Conference playoff race in, in a little bit. We'll kind of go through what's going on in, in both divisions in the wild card race. There's essentially three teams, two spots, and we'll kind of decide who we think might be able to pull through. But before we get into that, before we tee up to tonight's game, there were some uh, updates that we could get to from practice today. Uh, most notably, Ilya Samsonov has officially departed from the Toronto Maple Leafs. He's going to have his baby. So, uh, you know, good luck to him and, and his wife and that whole process. Uh, hopefully everything goes swimmingly. And it, I, I would assume that he'll be gone for a couple of games, a couple of days. So yeah. Joe Wall is going to come up also, and he'll probably back up Matt Murray, who's going to start in the game against the Panthers. Um, so I guess just first and foremost from the Locked On family, uh, congratulations to, to Ilya Samsonov. Yes, uh, you know, maybe he had a little something on his mind when he was in that net against the Islanders. It made it seem like things were moving quick in that department of like he was like, all right, uh, practice. He, he leaving. He knew that he was leaving after this yeah. game anyway. But like, should he have even gone on the road trip is like the question mm-hmm. that we all have. Like after the game now, it's like, should he just stuck around? I mean, clearly it didn't feel like he his mind was 100 percent on the game just based on how it ended like in hindsight we can say that but maybe we should have saw that coming a little bit yeah maybe i mean like here's the thing some people say oh it's his job he's got to be focused but when you're i don't know if this is his first child as well um I want, so when it's your first there's a lot of nerves that kind of get brought up in those moments you don't know how things are going to go so i i think that he probably yeah, had a lot on his mind maybe it would have made sense just to not have that as a, I wouldn't say a distraction, but just on his mind. Like Luke Shen didn't join with the Leafs when his wife was close to having a baby. They just said, you know what? Just stick around. There's no point in you coming 
they left him in Vancouver. Yeah. Like, because they played in Vancouver, so they just said yeah. you can just stay. <laughs> like, yeah, away from the team for like a week at, right after they got him. That probably makes more sense because he doesn't have to do that cross Canada travel as opposed to okay, you're in New York, something happens, you're a quick flight, you're not too far away, we can get you home as quickly as possible. But yeah, I think when you're when you're in that situation, you kind of want to be close and not have to worry about you know is she if his, is his wife dealing with things or does he need to be there for his wife even just through that whole process it sounds like it was something that was on his mind for sure uh definitely so he's going to not be in the lineup tomorrow which means matt murray is going to be the projected starter and oh last time matt murray played the florida panthers remember what happened yes yeah, uh, sadly i do didn't go well for uh, for Matt Murray. I think it was like four goals on eight shots, and it was the last time that we had seen him prior to that Ottawa game, I want to say, and then we know what happened there, and uh, he was then gone for another month. But hopefully he gets his chance to uh, uh, avenge that outing that he had uh, where he really struggled because he's going to get the start tonight. And um, Bobby McMahon was not at practice today to continue with some updates. He will be out with a knee injury. So I guess he had a knee injury that he suffered when he was in, uh, when he was down with the Marlies. So we got the call up. He has re aggravated that injury according to Sheldon Keith, and he'll be out for a little bit. So it uh, looks like Wayne Simmons checks into the lineup here. So, um, Potentially, we could see another twelve and seven, like or a eleven and seven situation with the injury. And Simmons was just playing there for practice reasons. I, I'm I'm not sure. I guess we'll find out at morning skate tomorrow. Potentially, um, actually, no. I think I did see that it's going to be twelve and six, if I'm not mistaken. I thought I did see. A I don't know if he confirmed exactly. He said he hadn't really said for sure, but it mm. seems like he's leaning towards a twelve and six. Well, like. Are you are you done with the eleven and seven? I was done with that a while ago. <laughs> yeah, like I I am too. Like I think ultimately, I think the team's going to have its most success with a a twelve and six figuration. We've already talked about there being too much going on. Like at, let's at least make sure we have the configuration with how you're going to you know split up the amount of defensemen and forwards. Let's get that settled uh, at the very least. Um, so yeah, so those are pretty much the, the, the updates from practice today. Uh, we did have TJ Brody return to practice. He's expected to play tomorrow night and he's got, uh, another new partner. Um, he's not going to be with Morgan Riley. Why don't we take a quick break and we can get back into uh, the projected lines for this game and kind of break things down. Cause there's a couple of notable differences from, uh, from the start of the last game into this game. And I think there's a little bit more meaning into the lineup that we will see going into tomorrow night's game. I'll explain what I mean uh, in just a moment, Dave, but before we do continue, uh, I do want to tell all the great folks listening and watching this podcast about our good friends over at FanDuel. Um, the big tournament is heating up now. I think the sweet 16 just about to kick off today. And now's the perfect time to download FanDuel, it's North America's number one sports book, and new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back. If your first bet doesn't win, just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. You can bet on everything from the money line to point scores, uh, goal scores, whatever you want. They've got it at FanDuel. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at bigger payouts with a same game parlay. And you can now do some same game parlays for hockey now which is available which is fantastic so don't miss out on your chance to get that no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars and bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on that's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more uh make every moment more with fanduel an official sports betting partner of the locked on network Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. It's Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti. We got a game tonight. Leafs in, uh, taking on the Panthers in Sunrise, Florida. And we got some new look lines at practice today. I mean, they actually look similar to how the game ended uh, against the Islanders. But I think that this is telling for maybe what Sheldon Keefe believes could, believes could be um 
his game one lineup. I mean, like, let, let's pull them up because I think we have uh, we have them here so we can get a, a visual of what we're looking at for those on YouTube and then uh, we'll explain what they are. So the top line is going to be Yarncroft with Matthews and Marner. Second line, Bunting, Tavares, and Nylander. Third line, Kerfoot, Achari, Lafferty. Fourth line, Zach Aston Reese, David Camp, and Wayne Simmons. Uh, I would argue, Dave, that this is pretty well what I would say is, is likely to be a game one lineup come playoff time. You just kick Achari into his fourth line role and you slot Ryan O'Reilly into that three C hole. And now all of a sudden, I think you've got your 12 forwards in the spots that you expect them to be in, I would say. Um, so I think this might be a little bit of foreshadowing for the the, the lineup that Keith may want to utilize come game one of the playoffs. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I mean, all the fans are kind of looking for some uh, consistency here at the lines. And I don't think that you can get any more consistent than what Sheldon Keefe has put forward here. Um, like you look at this lineup and I think the thing that always surprised me was I know and Sheldon Keefe has kind of mentioned that bunting his game has been great as of late, but that the fact that he's been moved pretty much been moved away from Austin Matthews completely. Um, whether or not that's the one I'm wondering if that's going to stay the same, I guess, because Matthew says he likes playing with Yarn Croak, that's just going to be an, something Sheldon Keefe is going to continue to work with. But other than that, I think this lineup is pretty much, yeah, everything you said, and then once Simmons is kind of moved out of there, I think everything kind of is is kind of set in stone. I mean, for me, like, Yarn Croak's just been the better player yes. for the last few weeks. Like, I, I don't think that's a hot take. So no. with the better player with them, I think it just makes sense. You know, I think he's he's earned the opportunity to stick with these guys. He's been given a an opportunity, speaking about Cal Yarncroft, and he's running with it, right? Like, he had a really successful uh, weekend, and then he didn't look horrible in the game the other night against the – I mean, no one looked good against the Islanders. We'll say that. But, you know, I, I don't think that uh, – I, I just think it, he's played and looked better on that top line with Austin Matthews than Bunting has of late. And you know that Bunting works with those two. So if things go awry early in the playoffs, you know you got something that you can go back to. But if that also is working, Yarncroft with Matthews and Marner, hey, roll with it. Give them 10 games, figure it out, and then, uh, you know, hopefully it, it, it's it's on fire come game one of the playoffs. Uh, the blue line, a little bit of a shakeup as well compared to what we saw in the last game, uh, obviously, TJ Brody did not play, but Jake McCabe was playing with Timothy Lilligren in the last game. That is not going to be the case. Um, Lilligren currently on the outside looking in unless they do decide to go with seven defensemen because the top three pairs are as such. You got Jake McCabe with TJ Brody, Morgan Riley, and Luke Shen, and uh, Gio and Hall back together with Gustafson and Lilligren as the extras at practice today and project to be the extras sitting up in the press box tomorrow um or tonight rather for when y'all are listening to this um so brody comes back and immediately gets put back with jake mccabe you reading into that uh yeah just a little bit because i thought maybe they would have wanted to have mccabe on his own and not have like give brody somebody else to kind of partner with um, but I guess Sheldon Keefe just, he liked what those two do. And especially on the road, you're going to need those two to kind of play maybe more heavy defensive minutes. And I think that's what you're going to see, uh, really against this Panthers team probably. Yeah. I mean, I would argue that if you take, look at all eight of those players, mm -hmm. if you had to take two of which to pair up to be your shutdown pair, I don't think there's any two that are better than McCabe and Brody. No. So like you're looking at it and and Sheldon Keefe says last year we had a shutdown pair in Muzzin and Brody and it worked out well. Like we need to do the same thing this year and allow them to do their work in their own zone and try and shut down Tampa as much as possible. And therefore he's looks like he wants to get McCabe and Brody comfortable playing with each other and hopefully give them a run. And this is kind of the start of that. Yeah, he's making that the uh, the Muzz and Brody pairing from last year, right? 
the one that looked pretty decent in the playoffs. And I think I, it's hard not to argue with that. I think McKay brings some of those qualities that Jake Muzzin br- brought. Um, so yeah, I think you're going to, you're going to see that similar deployment. If, if you're, yeah, if you're wondering how that's going to work, just pretty much picture what McCabe, uh, McCabe Muzzin and Brody were like last year and just transplant it to what, uh, McCabe and Brody will be doing this season. Now, my, my, my counter to that is what do you do with Morgan Riley, who seemingly plays his best hockey when he's with TJ Brody. And when you, take him off of Brody's flank, it, it doesn't typically go well. Um, so you're like kind of risking True. something in Riley to do that. You are. And maybe, I mean, I, I don't know how many games has he played with Shen since the, since I, Shen has been brought like to the league. Like, like Shen's only played like two games. Yeah, he hasn't played. So, like, I guess Sheldon Keith just wants to see can that pairing work, and if they can't work, then you're just gonna switch Shed with Brody. I think that could be the other, that might be the alternative to go with there. And then you still because you're gonna be playing Morgan Riley quite a bit. So if let's say you switch Brody and Shen up, then you can have Brody out there, and at least you'll be comfortable knowing that Riley and Brody can be can be a pairing that has worked and will and should be able to work. But yeah. I think they're going to give Riley. They should give Riley and Shen some time to develop some chemistry, and see if that could work. Because no one else on that list of Justin Hall or Timothy Lilligren, in my opinion, you're not going to put Morgan Riley with either of those two. Uh, I think he could fit with Lilligren. Hall, absolutely not. No. no way, no how. I I could see him and Lilligren getting a look. We've seen but, it before, yes. Yeah, and it hasn't looked terrible. Right. Like it, it hasn't looked bad. The, the underlying numbers are actually quite favorable with Riley and Lilligren together. Riley and Hall it's awful. got one of the worst pairings in the National Hockey League. That is well documented. Um, but Lilligren, I hate it. we'll see. Um, like, but, but to, you know, Shen's a guy who has played with a Riley esque player before. Like he, the last two seasons, his most common partner was Quinn Hughes when he's playing in, in Vancouver. So, you know, Riley plays a similar jump up into the rush offensive style. So it wouldn't be, you know, it's he's he's used to having to cover for a player. And that's kind of what Riley needs is someone who's defensively responsible. It's just the foot speed that does, you know, I do question for Luke Shen. Um, you know, when you're playing against a Tampa or a Boston and they get on the counterattack, should a, a, a turnover occur and, Leafs are prone for those, um, you know, Shen on the counterattack uh, on a, on a quick turnover, uh, you know, not the greatest uh, skater and, and maybe you want someone who could skate a little bit better, but we'll see. These are the options. And uh, I think we'll, we'll maybe get a couple of game look at this blue line and of this forward group and, and kind of see what happens. Um, and we'll do that tonight against the Panthers, Matt Murray uh, slated to be the starter with Joe wall um, to be the backup Samsonov back in Toronto for the birth of his child. Uh, speaking of the Panthers, they are in an absolute playoff race, my friend. So they've got a lot to play for in this game. Why don't we go over the playoff race and what's going on both up at the top and uh, down at the bottom for the wild card in the Eastern Conference. It's been a while since we've taken a look at that. So why don't we do that on the other side? But first, Dave, I want to tell the good folks about one of our show sponsors. Yes, and it is one of the top job sites right now in Indeed. So no matter how the game went, anytime you take the f- the field or the ice, you got a shot at greatness. Give your team the best shot of winning by recruiting more MVPs with Indeed. If you're hiring, you need Indeed because Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. It is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites trying to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help do it all. With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description. You can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have requirements. 
One of the things, obviously, about Indeed 2 is it makes it easier to hire great talent. According to Comscore, Indeed is the number one job site worldwide, and Indeed delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined, according to Talent Nest back in 2019. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash locked on. Offer valid through March 31st. So that's go to Indeed.com slash locked on to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Welcome back into the Locked On Lease podcast. It's Mike DiStefano and Dave Morsuti. We're your hosts here at Locked On Lease. We've got new content coming out to you each and every weekday, Monday through Friday, whether it's via audio form, podcast, wherever you get them, or right here on YouTube as well. And again, we're, we're hoping to get to 3K before the playoffs. So if you haven't already and you do listen to the show regularly, toss us a sub. Or if it's your first time and you're enjoying the conversation, Toss us a sub. That'd be greatly appreciated. And let your friends know about us as well. Um, so let's talk about the playoffs, which are fastly approaching. There's only a dozen games left in the Leaf schedule. And, you know, there are some other teams that are down to nine, ten games at this point. So um, the, the regular season is, is quickly coming to a close uh, we know we got Lee's Panthers tonight, which will be a playoff esque game. You know, the Panthers, one of those teams that are fighting for a playoff position. And the Leafs, despite everyone saying there's nothing to play for, and maybe that's why they've been a little aloof of late. Uh, yeah, there's this thing called home ice advantage that is still uh, up for grabs against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Why don't we pull up the Eastern Conference standings and uh, take a look at some things here? And we could just kind of talk about what we're looking at right now when it comes to the playoffs. Um, sure, let's start in the Metro since that's right up at the top here. Uh, so still a, a pretty good battle for the top of the Metro division. You've got the Carolina Hurricanes with 100 points. They had two games in hand, up two points on the New Jersey Devils. But that's that's definitely um, you know something that's still very much within reach for New Jersey to try and stake claim to that Metro division crown and, and claim uh, first round uh, and second round home ice advantage. Um, How do you think that shakes up between those two? Oh, it's also, also uh, I would rather face the wild card team than the Rangers who the loser of those two, We'll be playing the Rangers in round one. It's going to be really unfortunate. Let's say things stay the way they are, that one of the Rangers or Devils will be eliminated in round one because I think both teams would be phenomenal to watch in the playoffs. Fun teams. Really fun teams. That would be a great series if it was Rangers-Devils. No doubt about it. You got two, you know, geographically, they're close together. You got the rivalry there. But, man, yeah, if you're the Devils, you're, you you got to push as hard as you can to get out of that out of that situation. Give, if you're going to face the Rangers, try your best to make that a round two matchup potentially, right? If it, there's no guarantee the Rangers could beat the Hurricanes either. So it's it's a bloodbath in that metropolitan. I think it's it it shows just I mean, first off, just how great New Jersey's turnaround has been, but also just all three of these teams have elements that no other team wants to go up against. Maybe the Devils' goaltending is something that's a little suspect there, but everything else about these teams, like they're they're not easy matchups one way or the other. So it's going to be a very interesting way how that all shapes out. It's nice to see that the Metro will have some have the same issues that the Atlanta Division has had for many years. Too many good teams that are going to have to unfortunately deal with some tough uh, tough endings in round one. Yeah, man, the East is a gauntlet, an absolute gauntlet. We've been talking about that forever. Like, if Toronto's lucky to finally get out of a first round for the first time in 18 years, uh, that's great. And the reward is to play probably the Boston Bruins. And should they somehow upset the Bruins, their reward is going to be one of these three teams, (laughs) the Carolina Hurricanes, New Jersey Devils, or New York Rangers. Like, that's... God, the East is so, so difficult, which is why a lot of people are kind of bandwagoning on, you know, some of the top Western teams. Like if you're talking about in terms of betting value, just strictly because whoever comes out of the West probably going to be less 
battered, bruised, and beaten once they get there mm-hmm. might be a bit of an advantage. That's just a little tip for you if you do want to go and make a wager on a Western Conference team at uh, at uh, FanDuel. Um, in terms of strength of schedule, though, when we look at these three teams, Carolina has the hardest schedule remaining of these three squads. They have the 12th hardest schedule. Um, they've got Boston, New York, Toronto, and Tampa all once. Um, and then if you look, it looks as though the Rangers have a 20th hardest schedule and the Devils actually have uh, one of the easier schedules. Um, Will this be the eighth or ninth easiest schedule the rest of the way for them? So not too bad. They only play uh, the Rangers and the Bruins would be the only two uh, real hard, you know, teams. I guess the Jets are considered a playoff team. But then they could pick up wins against Columbus, Chicago, uh, Pittsburgh, who's been kind of flaky of late despite getting a win tonight, Ottawa, who's been very flaky, Washington, and they got two against Buffalo, who's been uh, uh, you know a team that's been on the downswing. So, you know, the Devils, I mean, they've got a, an easier path to pick up some points here. Um, so we'll see what happens with them. Okay, let's look at the uh, Atlantic division. And we're very familiar with the Atlantic, obviously, with the Toronto Maple Leafs being there. And this one's a little bit more cut and dry. You've got Boston at the tip top, 113 points. Oh, my God. And still 12 games to go. They've lost 11 games this year in regulation. That's crazy. Only 11 games. And they are a plus 114 goal differential. It's it's just ridiculous the season that the Boston Bruins have had. And then you get to the second and third team in this division, Toronto, Tampa Bay. And uh, only three points separate them. Toronto with two games in hand, though. Um, and they do play each other uh, coming up. I believe there's still – there's only one game between them. Yeah, they got one game against each other coming up. Um, and that could be a very pivotal and important game, I would imagine. Uh, but, you know, there's there's – I, I, I find it odd that there's a conversation, Dave, that home ice doesn't matter. Like, where do you sit on that? Because I think that it matters a lot. Oh, it matters big time. I, When you look at just what it, it has nothing really to do with the fans, even more so just how you how teams strategize for the road and away matchups. Like, I, I think that's become such a big thing. And even if you're the Leafs, too. There's one factor that I think people forget. Ilya Samsonov looks so much better at home than he does away. Yep. You're telling me you don't want to put yourself in a situation where Samsonov gets to play potentially four games at home versus three games at home? Yep. I think, I'm gonna, I think the math kind of works in the least favor if they get home ice there. Speak my language on that one, buddy. Speak in my language on that one because that's exactly what I was going to bring up. He He – allows a full goal less at home than on the road, like a full goal for on you know, a per 60-minute basis. It's insane. Um, scroll over a little bit so we could see the home and road splits as well because that's something that you also look at and you probably think to yourself, yeah, Tampa's pretty good at Amalia Arena. Maybe we don't want to go into that building uh, four times. So you, you talk about it. Look at that. 25, 7, and 5. Both exactly teams identical. An exact record of 25, 7, and 5 at home. So home ice advantage, does that mean anything to these teams? Clearly it does if you take a look at the the, the splits here right now. On the road, the last yeah, time. it was a 500 team on the road. Yeah, bring them to Toronto four times. Absolutely, home ice advantage means something. I look can't believe the nonsense that's coming out of people's mouths saying, well, they had home ice last year, and look what happened. It's a different season, okay? Yeah. It's a different year, and clearly, clearly, it still freaking matters, people. Can can these two teams just stop being so identical at times, though? Like, both teams are 5-4-1. and one. Both have identical home records. If you look at the playoffs last year and how almost identical the two teams played against each other. Like it's, it's, it's getting a little too crazy here. I'm going to, it's, it's getting a little, a little weird. It should be a good series. Right. And, and I know it will be ultimately it's, it's going to be a a, a terrific series. You know, it's going to be, Um, but where like the real battle, I guess, lies here in the playoffs in the East is for the wild card spot. And ultimately you tell me if you think there's another team in it, but for me, 
It's three teams, two spots. You got the Islanders, who currently are uh, in the first wild card position, 82 points. You've got Pittsburgh, who with a win against Colorado tonight jumps ahead of Florida. They've got 80 points with uh, 11 games to go. Florida, one point back of them on the outside looking in, 79 points, also 71 games to go. Um, Dave, gun to your head. Which two of these three teams do you think makes it in? Man, um, I still think Pittsburgh gets in. Like they're for like I'm I'm locking them in. I said the Panthers uh, were the team that look like they're gonna get in. I'm gonna stick with that. I think. Uh, so you have the Islanders who are currently in front, falling out of it. Yeah, I think so. I think the. It's going to be tough if the Islanders can't get Barzell back. I know Brock Nelson left that game against the Leafs. If he's injured, I don't know what his status is at all. Like the Islanders can't afford to lose players right now. And I think the Panthers, not only did they get it, they were get, were they getting players back, but they've been playing so much better of late. Oh, you just watched the Islanders spank the Leafs, man. Yeah, but the Leafs spanked themselves in that game. That's true. <laughs> so like. I, I, I couldn't I think it was Armando from Locked On Panthers that brought up a like a great point of just how good um the Panthers have been since the trade deadline. They have been really good and they're getting good goaltending. Like Bobrovsky's been solid. Mac Chuck's been great all year. He's like an undercover um yeah. MVP candidate if they make it into the playoffs, legitimately. Yeah, like they've been they've been so good of late and I think, I think they're just hitting. They're hitting their stride at the right time, right? They're that's that's what it all yeah. comes down to, especially when it comes to getting a wild card. It doesn't matter what you did prior to the start of the season. If you can get on a run at the right time, watch out. <laughs> like if I'm the Islanders, I get a little worried because they did have a bit of a lead. They had some cushion with the games in hand. That's not really much of the case anymore. I know the Islanders have played well. The th- one thing that Islanders do have going for them is Elias Sorokin. He wow. is the guy that can. He's the difference maker. He is like he is uh, like he is the best goaltender out of all those teams. If you ask me, what's the deciding factor of what why the Islanders could keep their spot? It's because of Sorokin. But I don't know. I don't know if the Islanders will have the manpower to get it done. I'll I'll tell you one thing that's in the Islanders' favor over both Pittsburgh and Florida, and it's that column RW, regulation wins. And if there's a tiebreaker, they currently win that tiebreaker by having the most regulation wins, which would also give Florida an advantage over Pittsburgh. So Pitt yes. has to basically they got to end up winning that thing outright if they uh if they you know want to make the playoffs and uh they look good in that game against Colorado. I watched that game. They looked really, really good. But l- lately, they have not. So hopefully this was kind of them turning things around and they can go and have themselves uh, a nice stretch run here in the final 11 games of the season and, and ensure their playoff spot. Because, dude, they've made the playoffs every um, – Crosby has been in the playoffs every year since his second year in the NHL. Missed in his first season. Second year onward, since he's had the captaincy, this man has brought this team to the playoffs. We already know that Washington and Ovi not going to be in the playoffs at this point. Like, we need one of those guys in there, don't we? Like, yeah. one of them's got to make it in, man. So Pittsburgh, I, I'm, I'm hoping that Pittsburgh is the team that makes it through. I actually think that it's going to remain the way it is. I think the Islanders will sneak in. I think Pittsburgh's going to sneak in. I my bold prediction at the beginning of the year was that Florida was going to miss the playoffs for presence trophy to add the playoffs. That was my prediction at the beginning of the season. I still think that happens. I I do. I just I, it's it's a team that is not great defensively, and um, I think they've got Toronto three times. Like they they don't have the easiest schedule going forward either. So. You know, that's a team. Let's let's look that up, actually, because we looked it up in the uh, other division. So we might as well look it up in terms of the wild card. I got it. No, no, no. We'll, we'll stay stay there for a quick minute. We'll, we'll stick with the East. We'll do the West tomorrow. OK, we'll stick in the Eastern Conference. But I do just want to look at the strength of schedule for these three teams okay. 
remaining as well. I'm just looking it up on my phone here. Don't worry about it. Um, but in terms of easiness, the Panthers have the hardest schedule. They've got Carolina. They've got Toronto three times still. The Leafs had the Panthers three more times. They got them tonight and then two more times in the final uh, dozen games of the season. It's kind of crazy how little they've played already and how many games there are still to go. Um, but yeah, then they've got Carolina, Toronto three times, and they got the Rangers. So those are some difficult wins for them that they got to try and pick up. Um, but then there are some winnable games, right? They've got Ottawa a couple times. They've got Columbus. They got Montreal. So there's some winnable games for them. Pittsburgh's got a little bit of an easier schedule than them. Um, they've got Detroit a couple times, Philly, Nashville, Chicago, Columbus. They do have a couple of solid teams like Dallas and Boston and New Jersey, but they are ranked 19th in terms of strength of schedule where Florida's 15th. And then uh, in terms of the other team remaining, where are they at? Who's the other team that we had here? The Islanders are 21st, so that'd be what, like 10th or 11th easiest schedule? Um, so they got uh, Carolina, Jersey. They've got Tampa twice, but then they've got Washington twice, and they've got Philly and Buffalo, Montreal and Columbus. So um, – of those three teams that are remaining fighting for those two spots, the team with the hardest schedule going forward is the Florida Panthers. So, mm. you know, I'm, I'm going to roll with the Islanders and the Penguins. All right. Well, it, it wouldn't, it, it's funny because I was just looking up who have been the best team since March 1st and the Panthers, like the Panthers are trying to make up ground on the Islanders and, and Penguins and the Islanders have matched everything that the Panthers have done. So, Maybe maybe they'll prove me wrong. You know, the Panthers, you know, maybe maybe they'll hit a wall at some point too. That's, that's I'll, also possible as well. Tell tell the people who uh who the other teams are up there because I would I also looked into that number a couple of days ago and was very shocked to see one of the teams that are up, actually a couple of the teams that are up there in terms of best uh in the month of March. Yeah, so since March 1st, uh, I'm pulling it up on my other computer because I, uh, I laptop's easier to search all about it. So the LA Kings, uh, they are 7-0-2, 16 points in nine games. The Vegas Golden Knights, 9-2-0, 18 points in 11 games. Minnesota Wild, 7-1-2 with 16 points. Sorted by points percentage. Points percentage, which I can do. Uh, let's see. So it's the Kings, the Golden Knights, the Oilers, the Wild, the Islanders, the Panthers, the Bruins, and lo and behold, the anti-tanking Vancouver Canucks with the point seven hundred uh, win percentage. The Dallas Stars, the Rangers. Where are the Coyotes? In the Coyotes. Coyotes are six three and two in eleven games. They're kind of near the bottom. Okay, uh, I think they're maybe, bottom, but they're in the maybe middle. It was, maybe it was since I went on vacation. So they went on like a look it up from March 8th or 7th or something. Look it up from March 7th. So the Coyotes are like one of the top teams in the NHL since then. They won yeah, like so, six games in a row. Yeah. So they are, in terms of points percentage, they are fifth uh, at seven eight, with the 786. Yeah. Crazy. I <laughs> just, in case you didn't know, like, like guys like Clayton, have been tough to play in the last two weeks. Yeah. Clayton Keller, uh, I think Nick Schmaltz, Barrett Hayden, unreal top line. They actually have, apparently, they do have some decent players among all the retired injured guys um, that that team pays for. Well, they're probably going to cost themselves a Connor Bedard by winning all these games. So, yeah. The, that's, what uh, you get. that's what you get, Gary. I blame Gary. Actually, before we leave, um, you want to pull up the Connor McDavid audio? Yeah, we can do that quickly. Yeah, let's do that really quickly. Uh, we kind of spoke about it yesterday because we were both pretty angry after the World Baseball Classic and, and just thinking to ourselves, like, why don't we have anything like this in hockey? And it's really disappointing. And uh, obviously, that was the the big conversation around most hockey circles today. And Connor McDavid was asked about it and, he shared his thoughts pretty bluntly, what he thinks about it and the lack of international hockey. 
That was the year. That what do you think playoffs. about that kind of you know, challenge? I thought it was really cool. That's what we've been asking for in hockey for a long time, right? Um, you know, it's best on best. Um, you know, look, everyone's talking about baseball. And, you know, you see you know, Tony versus Trello. You know, that's what hockey's been missing for you know, almost a decade now. So, um, yeah, that's what, been, that's what we've been asking for. That's what we've been asking for, he says. When you're on mute, pal. Sorry. The NHL players don't ask for much. They just want to see best on best. I mean, when the best player in your game speaks, you hope that holds weight. You really do. And you hope that holds weight. You had Sidney Crosby speak on the playoff format at the All-Star break. And now you got McDavid talking about international hockey. I mean, at some point, I, like Gary Bettman's got to do something to appease the players. The players are asking for this. We know they want this. Let's get it done because the players want it. The fans want it. And ultimately it's best for the game. Is it like, that's what I don't understand, man. Like these business people should know that short term pain for long term gain should be, you know, in their wheelhouse as business people, right? You got to spend money to make money. I don't understand. Like, that's literally all this is, is in the long run, you will make more money by these international tournaments because it will grow your game and will eventually make you more money and grow the game. Yeah. But they just don't don't comprehend. Like, I don't know what the hell the situation is. But again, when you got guys like McDavid and guys like Crosby talking about this stuff, you got to hope that it holds weight and really sparks conversation with the the people who can make these decisions. I'll say two things about that. One, I hope that the players that are speaking out about this really push for when they have their meetings with the NHLPA and the NHLPA can communicate that to the NHL because that's where the real negotiations happen. Well, who just Bill Walsh just got uh, nominated as the new NHLPA president, right? Uh, yeah, or no, yeah, president. No, what is he? Something. Uh, the new president is Marty Martin J. Walsh. No, Marty Walsh. Sorry, not Bill. Walsh. Marty Walsh. Uh, yeah. So you got a new guy in there. Maybe it'll. Uh, maybe it will lead to something there. But I also think that yeah, the players have to really push for it. And dude, they've been that? pushing. They've been pushing. Like that's why they almost had a a uh, a lockout two years ago. I know. Yeah. Like literally that was one of their big points is want to play international. They almost like locked themselves out the year of the pandemic because that was one of their points that they wanted. And the NHL said, we will try and make it happen. And then of course, Omicron hit and it just made things very difficult. And we understand why NHL always didn't end up at the Olympics this time around it. it you know, it, it made sense ultimately, but uh, you can't so tell me that the last eight years, you know, it made sense to not have international or the eight years following right now would make sense not to have international hockey. Like it just doesn't at this point, get it done, get it done, please. If it has to be without Russian hockey players, like it sucks, I guess, because there's a lot of really good Russian players, mm -hmm. but don't make me miss out on seeing Crosby McDavid on the same team because those idiots can't play. I'm also going to add that if the NBA and MLB can figure it out, the NBA where players make a crap ton of money, teams make a crap ton of money, but they're still sending their best players to the Olympics. I think the NHL can figure it out as well. And, you know, maybe, maybe I'm having a hard time having faith in the NHL when they decide that Fanatics is a great uh, jersey brand for them wow. going forward. I know I don't want to open that can of worms, but I think it's kind of relevant, relevant to see where the NHL is kind of lacking in terms of where the other sports are going. Are you saying that the NHL is prone to to making mistake after mistake after mistake? Not not my NHL. You must be talking about a different NHL. Yeah, clearly, clearly. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that tomorrow because that is a longer conversation that uh, we just don't have time for at this point. We've gone a little long on this one, so we'll wrap it up. We got a game tonight: Leafs and Panthers. Toronto looking to respond after a tough game on the island. Um, it's going to be Matt Murray in net. He will be the starter trying to look to bounce back off the last time he played this team where he looked not bueno. So uh, hopefully the Leafs can pull it out. 
You know, the Panthers are definitely going to be uh, really motivated to, to pick up points, especially with Pittsburgh getting back into that playoff position and then falling out uh, last night. So both teams highly motivated to play. So should be a good, fun game, just like, you know, they typically always are against these teams. They're always high-scoring affairs between these two clubs, no matter where they're playing. So uh, I expect to see much the same tonight. That'll do it for us here today on the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On These Podcasts on all podcasts and platforms. You receive daily Leafs content five days a week. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti. Uh, leave a like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. That'd be greatly appreciated. We'll be back tomorrow night. We will be, or tomorrow morning, rather. Uh, we're going to be uh, recapping the game against the Panthers. So until then, keep locked right here on Lockdown Leafs.